fire away, Mr. Beeler. All right, Coach, how was the bye week? If you had two or three things that you wanted to accomplish, what would you have put at the top of the list? Well, I would say number one, I mean, we have some, we had some of the most competitive practices we've had all year, um, all the way from Tuesday to our Thursday practice um, before we got a few days there at the end of the week. Uh, the, the mentality and the urgency to start practice was awesome. Uh, there were a bunch of competitive things built into practice as well as just, um, you know, the team periods and competing against each other and how we did that. As well as obviously giving the guys that have been out um, some time to continue to heal, and we obviously that that has improved their situation, uh, which hopefully uh, some will get some of those guys back uh, here this week. But as well as the guys that have been playing that have been banged up, it, it gave them an opportunity to take some of the reps off their body, and as well as continue to get better and grow in the areas that we need to. Um, we spent some time earlier on in the week focusing on the run game and the, really the techniques and fundamentals that, that can help us improve the run game as we head down the back uh, stretch of the season here and being able to simplify things so that we can come off and play with a, a better mentality and, and physicality. And going to Colorado State, looking at their numbers, defensively, they really seem to, you know, holding people under 300 yards and to 20 points a, a game. What do you see in their defense that has allowed them to be able to post those kind of numbers? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, their front, their, their D-line, they're all graduates and or seniors as well as their inside linebackers. And uh, they play, they got experience and they play physical at the line of scrimmage. They do a really good job, um, especially here of late. I know earlier on in the season, uh, they had some guys that they were missing. Um, but here in the, in the past month, uh, they've done an unbelievable job at the line of scrimmage, uh, not only um, – stop the run, but creating pressure on the quarterback as well. Thanks, Coach. Andy, you obviously worked on a lot of X's and O's type of stuff, and I might even be fishing for a question here because I'm not sure what your mind is, but how much did you work on mentality? How much did you work on attitude? How much did you work on, you know, life between the ears during the bye week? That's all the whole week started out, Mike. You know, it's um, resetting the vision on what it looks like, what, what uh, the work – takes to be to become a consistent team that teamwork and establishing that mentality of what it looks like you know from from the very beginning of the week and um, again we've we had some of our most competitive practices that we've had in the past year consistently for a week and we're continuing to build on that as we um, we evaluate where we're at in terms of mentality Mike and, and obviously growing that and we have to grow that and the way we practice is everything. We can sit here and talk about the amount of reps we can, we can get as a team and, and team run periods and those things. And it may not be where we want it to be, but there's other things that we can do, Mike, to create that mentality at practice as well. Um, and we got to be very strategic about that, especially as we head down the stretch here to improve ourselves. How do you, I guess, what did you find that was, I don't know if wrong is the right answer. Where did you want to improve the mentality and, and where did you specifically kind of work on? How do you fix that? How do you work on that? Well, I think number one, it starts with a purpose. Mentality always starts with a purpose. Why are we doing what we're doing? How do we approach every single day? How competitive are we every day? And that starts with how we get here in the mornings. Um, that mentality doesn't start on the field. It starts in the meetings and being prepared. If you're prepared in the meetings and, and we do a great job as coaches and we set that mentality through how we teach uh, the fundamentals and technique, it, it provides confidence, Mike, and the confidence to play a certain way and use the tools that you've been taught will create the mentality. And that's how we've always built it here. And we've got to get back to reestablishing that. And, and really, I mean, it starts with us as coaches and how we teach and how we build the tools and the fundamentals. Thank you, Andy. Andy, in, in my nine, nine years covering the team, I haven't heard a whole lot of talk about that kind of uh, stuff, and whether it be the meetings and being late and that kind of stuff, whatever. I mean, what, what, how surprising has it been to you that you're having this here in the middle of the season, week eight, be dealing with all this kind of stuff that's, that's not the X's and O's? In terms of what are you talking uh, about? You've talked a lot about having to reestablish the foundation, and you mm -hmm. alluded to last game to maybe guys being late to meetings and just other stuff and you know what it takes during the week to get to game day to get to where you want to be that's just a lot of stuff I haven't 
frankly heard Coach Harson or the last year of Coach Pete talk about it in the nine years I've been here. What, 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 what? what it's what, been so it's been a reestablish of the foundation since day number one, since January, since we got here. Reestablishing what it means to, to bleed blue, what it means to, to have the family first, the team first. And what does that family look like? A family is, it takes great teamwork to make a family and reestablishing what that looks like every single day and creating a competitive environment where we, again, we have a certain purpose and competitiveness when we show up here every single day. And that's what we're working to reestablish. Um, and again, it's been, it's been since January when we got here that we sat down uh, with every single one of the players in the program and asked some things that need to change about the program. What has happened? And what in the last couple of years that we've done well, and what are the things that we need to, we need to cut out and what do we need to do better? And that's been a primary focus since January when we came in here and we sat down and we asked, what do we need to do a better job of? What, what can you tell us about why CT Thomas is no longer on the team? Well, we can say this, you know, just like we released a statement and we wish him nothing but the best going forward in his future. And, and as we do with everything else, BJ, um, what happens here stays here. And, and again, we wish him nothing but the best going forward. Thank you. And yeah, I know every game is important, especially every conference game. But when you look at this game, it's really a must win in terms of just bowl eligibility when you consider what's left on your schedule. Have you kind of gotten that message across to your players this week? No, we, we're talking about just this week, you know, just one and no mentality, winning each and every day and building – Building on this, uh, you know, what we did last week in terms of how um, we showed up here every single day to work with, with the competitive spirit that it's going to take, you know, to, to be successful. And really, you know, at the end of the, as we go down the back stretch here, it is really about each day, each week, and just focusing on that, not worrying about what's out in front of you. And you talked about this a couple of weeks ago, but, but you're, you said you're not worrying about the future. You're, you're worrying about right now, but, you know, Assuming you guys do maybe lose another couple of games, is there a tipping point where you start throwing in some of those freshmen that you start getting them, getting them some playing time late in the season? We're getting freshmen uh, playing time right now. Um, you know, whether, Ron, they're, they're backups and they're ready to get in or and or we do put them in. Like, we, we there are guys that are in the mix each and every week um, to provide depth and, honestly, guys that have developed behind the scenes that are doing a really good job on all levels of whether it be defense and or offense, there's certain offense alignment that have done a really good job. You know, Mason Randolph is a guy that has made tremendous strides as an offense alignment and a young player. Um, on the defensive side of the ball, there's guys on all levels of the defense and not only um, in terms of defense, but special teams as well and, and how these guys are, are adding to the depth on special teams and, and may get their shot to play here down the stretch if needed. And I'm curious about one of those young guys, Herbert Gums. Uh, what right. stands out to you about him on the field and off the field mentality-wise? Well, he's got a physical capability now. He's, he's talented. He's explosive. Um, you know, here in the last uh, three weeks, we've been able to increase his rep load coming off of the injury that he had last year. And so we've really been able to – Increase the amount of reps that he's able to take in team periods uh, consistently, and it's part of his progression back into play and getting him back into games and being able to play him more reps. And uh, he is a talented young man that is explosive, but Ron, I mean, he he hasn't played a lot in the last year, so it's just it's going to take a little bit of experience and, and work to, uh, you know, and he'll keep growing. How about his mentality and maturity level off the field? You know what? He's a young man that's learning and growing. He's uh, this is the second year in the program. So is for any young guy, um, you know, he's making strides and improvements and in, in, in terms of off the field and in the classroom and um, doing a good job of that stuff. And obviously, the more you get your house in order off the field, um, the more you can focus and have more consistency on the field. Thank you. Jay, Paul, Jay and Will. And then just a reminder, guys, we're doing two questions the first time through so we can get to everybody. Go ahead, Jay. Andy, how we doing? What's up, buddy? Um, Andy, we know that uh, more than anything during the bye, you, you also needed to try to, to rest up and get a little healthy. I know that some of this stuff you can only go so far into, but were you guys able to get healthy during the bye week? Are you expecting anybody back? And when you look at a guy like uh, Kekani Okola, Holomalia Gonzalez, he, you know, we're, we're going into the seventh game, week eight. 
Right. We haven't seen him yet. Any, any update on him too? No, we're we're hoping here in the middle of the season uh, to see where he was at and further evaluate his situation. I think we should know here, you know, in the next couple of weeks or so, within the next week, um, what that looks like. But we were to answer your initial question. Uh, there were a ton of guys. I mean, obviously the bye week was huge for guys that have been out. Um, the extended rest and the guys that have been playing and, you know, playing seven games already this season and, and for certain guys to get the work they needed, but also, um, you know, not nearly the same amount of reps you would have in, you know, a week when you're preparing for an opponent. So, again, it was extremely competitive last week, but at the same time, we were able to get some guys uh, fresh. Um, Andy, I know that you kind of have already addressed this a little bit today. But as you talk about, you know, reestablishing the foundation and what it, um, it means to be a Boise State football player, um, I know that you said that you've addressed it. Have, have you seen some of the results so far? And I know that um, it, it might be a work in progress, but, but have you seen those results? And are you in, encouraged by those results that you can get it fixed here and, and have a, a solid month of November? Very encouraged, you know, and, and by the player's response and, the way that re they responded off the field last week, the way they competed, you know, off the field and on the field and the way they understand and the way they're bringing things forward too. now that we can even continue to move forward in terms of, um, you know, increasing the, the competitiveness and of how we're preparing again, both on and off the field. It is uh, last week was a big week. It was a huge week and um, the, the be able to grow in, all, in certain areas that we must grow to be more consistent with the things that we're talking about that are part of that foundation. We took a huge step last week and we started off, uh, today was our first practice coming off a weekend where the guys had you know a few days off and they did a tremendous job out there today. Thanks, Eddie. Coach, um, what does Colorado State bring defensively that has your concern? Uh, their, their experience up front, again, I mean, there's their D line is full of uh, grads and, and seniors and their inside linebackers. Uh, again, in the last month, uh, those guys, they're back to, you know, full strength with everyone being back in the lineup. And um, they've done a great job against the run game since those guys have been back. And, and not only that, but creating pressure on the quarterback. Uh, they, they have a fair amount of uh, six man pressures that we're going to have to be able to handle. And um, not only the six man pressures, but even when they're rushing forward, being able to handle our one on ones and compete and be able to give the quarterbacks time to get through the progression. A lot of teams uh, script the first 15 or so plays of a ball game. Um, with your slow starts in the second half, any thoughts or do you already script the first 15 plays or so offensively in the second half? Yes, there's a there's strategy that goes into those things, and there's there's two different plans to put into play that that are always prepared depending on how the first half goes, um, and that's something we talked about. Obviously, huge. I mean, that's been a deal, right? You know, the consistency starting in in the second half, um, and what does that look like? And to be honest, with you, we got we got guys that really care, and and sometimes you know when when we don't get started off uh, quickly there in the second half, you know, we just got to understand that we don't need to press. We need to stay the course. We need to focus on executing the plan. And that starts with us, obviously, as coaches and committing ourselves to, you know, this This is a, a game that, as we've spoken about today, involves a lot of mentality and establishing the run game and, and being able to build from there and um, provide the confidence, you know, in the operation of, of the quarterbacks to, to be able to move the sticks. Thanks, Coach. Hey, Andy, you look at Colorado State's offense. What stands out to you about their tight end, Trey McBride? Well, he does it all. I mean, there's there's not a lot of tight ends that are in-line tight ends that can come off the ball and establish an edge and set an edge in the run game and then line up at X wide receiver and be able to run the routes he does. I mean, he is, uh, you know, he's considered one of the best tight ends in, in the nation for a reason. Um, and you put that along with his his length and his size and his his ability to run. I mean, there's it, it, he's he's you, you just don't see as many tight ends that can do it all like that. This day and age, you see a guy who is more of an H split out tight end or an inline blocker. Um, he has. You know, he's got the full package of, of being able to establish, again, the edge and all the different things they do with him in the pass game as well.
you look at their special teams numbers uh, with their punting and field goal kicking, how important is winning that battle on Saturday? It is always important. I mean, uh, special teams and, and the ability to change the game or create field position has always it's been a big part of the games that we've been successful in. And so um, playing at altitude there, you know, you the ball's going to fly a little bit more. Um, and they've done a tremendous job, especially with their punt team and being able to flip the field. And, and we understand that. And, uh, um, you know, we'll obviously playing at altitude, like we talked about, is going to have that ball flying a little bit more. And there are certain areas of the game where you can take advantage of that. Thanks, Andy. Okay, I got, we got time for follow up. So BJ's got one and then Jay. Okay. Andy, I know it's been nine days. We didn't really get a chance to talk to you last week. I just wanted to follow up on the, the fourth down where you had 10 guys on the field. Um, just, just, I know you were frustrated, obviously, after the game, but now that you've had time to, figure it out and what, what what can you say about I guess how how you know what that happened and if that should have been a receiver or a tight end or running back or, or what happened there and I guess generally for you seven you know big picture seven games in as head coach now dealing with clock management uh, game management you know that type of stuff what's what's this learning process been like for you as you as you uh you know start your your head coaching career here well number one in your first question um it comes down to us community doing a better job of communicating you know, as a coaching staff and being able to communicate in that huddle and be clear and concise about um, the personnel that's going on the field. And we take ownership in that. Um, it doesn't really, at this point, matter to put who was supposed to be on the field or who wasn't. At the bottom line is it comes down to us, BJ, doing a better job. And like I said, after the game, when you asked, it's on us, it's on me. And I got to do a better job with that. Um, am, I, am I good to go, Greg? Yeah, go ahead, Jim. Um, Andy, um, through, through the bye week, obviously it's important because you guys can uh, get out and recruit and, and do things like that. What, what else did you do in your bye week despite, or, um, other than, you know, have those few practices with your team last week? Did, did you get any family time? And, and how, did, how did the recruiting scene go as, as much as you can say, obviously? Yeah, no. Um, well, the recruiting was awesome. It was great to get out. There's a lot of young men that are excited to be a part of this program and have been around here enough on um, visits, unofficial or officially, to see you know what we are establishing and building behind the scenes and the direction we're going. And there's a lot of young men that are going to be very impactful in coming in here. And so it was good to get out. It was the first time being out recruiting on the road in two years, almost two years. So um, that was that was a treat in itself to be able to do that. You know, there was a lot of evaluations going on from, you know, on all different levels throughout the course of last week, the beginning of the week and applying that stuff through our practice week. And then, uh, you know, coming back off the road recruiting, most of us got back at some point, either, you know, early morning Saturday or, or Saturday during the day and to be able to see our families for a few hours was huge. And then right back to it on Sunday morning early and, and, you know, finishing the game plan and the prep for for this week coming up, but also too to be able to get out in front um, and and make sure that we have the things organized and plotted out uh, for the for uh, the rest of this week. That's crazy, Andy. Thank you. Mike Prater, go ahead. Andy, I know it's not a top priority for you right now, especially in the season, but I wanted to ask about name, image, and likeness uh, and how Boise State as a football program deals with that. We're, we're doing a show this week on it's a first year thing and, and the right. university could get better. Student athletes could get better. Bronco Nation and the biz community can get better. Where do you want to see it get better? Because at the end of the day, I think it comes back to recruiting. I, I think it's, it's a matter of opportunities, Mike, as you know, you're in that business, you know, um, and that's part of what you do. And it's just, uh, there's opportunities everywhere in creating an infrastructure to take advantage of those opportunities and educating. Um, educating not only the players, um, but making sure that we're all on the same page. A lot of the guys will get representation to help them with the name, image, and likeness. That's what's, that's what's happened. I think within the community, people understanding in the community what they can do with the player's name, image, and likeness. Uh, there's a lot of people that don't understand that um, they can directly contact um, the student athletes to create an Im image and likeness deals. And whether that's food sponsorships, um, there's been talks of uh, car sponsorships, uh, supplement sponsorships. Obviously, it's all got to fall within the parameters of the NCAA. 
but there's different levels and different areas where guys have been able to um, establish some name, image, and likeness stuff. And I think that will continue to grow, uh, especially after this first year of, of working through the process and really understanding what do these opportunities look like and as we grow our, our organization and helping the student athletes do so. Local recruiting, it's a beautiful thing when you can go after the Tyler Crows and the Austin Bolts of the world. Um, but what's, what's your policy, what's your philosophy on local recruiting? Because sometimes if it doesn't go well, sometimes if they're not getting the playing time, sometimes if there are issues, um, everybody knows who these people are and they all want it to go well. Uh, what, what are the pros and cons of local recruiting? The pros for us have always been establishing um, the mentality within the program with the local guys that have grown up around here and that have bled blue since they were kids. And, you know, you're talking about Tyler Gurren, you're talking about guys like that that have earned scholarships. Um, you know, and for us, yeah, there's only 11 guys on the field. Have those guys had an impact? Has Tyler Crow had an impact on special teams? Yes. Yeah. Tyler, has uh, Bolt had an impact on special teams? Yeah. So in terms of it not going well, I'm not sure what, what you're alluding to there, but it has always been a priority um, to recruit uh, this, this state first, I mean, we've had tremendous players come out of the Fruitland area. Um, we've had tremendous players um, come from all over the state in the smallest towns. We've had them come from Riggins, Idaho. It's been a priority. And so we've had guys that have earned scholarships that have walked on here. We've had guys that we've recruited and put on scholarship. We've had guys that have come here and not earned a scholarship, but still had a huge impact and earned their, their degree. So, um, you know, the current guys that are in our program from the state, they're doing a good job. Andy, thank you. Looks like Ron has one more. Go ahead. Coach, uh, in past years, Boise State's always had packages for its, for its backup quarterbacks. This year, we've only seen Hank out there. Is that a product of his grasp of this scheme? Is that a personal preference of yours just to play what quarter, one quarterback? What went into that? In terms of not having packages for multiple quarterbacks? Yes. Now, there's always uh, – I think there's a, a consistency that, especially when, when we're building a, a run game, that there's – like we spoke about, there's a certain level of uh, simplicity that we got to be able to keep so we can come off and, uh, and play fast and physical. Um, where we go from that in terms of building multiple packages for quarterbacks to step in and play – um, you can see that as a couple different ways. We've had some wildcat situations to get Khalil Shakir back there and be able to handle the ball and do those things. So there's, um, I think that's partly so of what you're talking about too, is getting the ball in someone else's hands that can create an extra number in the run game. Is that what you're referring to? Uh, not really. I guess, I guess I should have to ask it more directly. Why isn't Jack Sears playing this year? Yeah, that's what I thought you were asking. Um, so yeah, let's just be upfront and honest. You know, we don't, mm -hmm. we don't have to beat around it. Like, you know what, because um, Hank, Hank has been efficient. Are there things that Hank has to improve on? Yeah. Or should we take Hank out? Hank has done a good job being efficient with the ball. Do we have to eliminate some of the negative yardage plays? Yeah. And as part of that on Hank, there's no doubt. But not all of that is on Hank either. Part of that's on the wide receivers. Part of that's on the offensive line. It's a team game. Um, and if we felt at any point where – you know, Jack has made tremendous strides, especially in the bye week. Jack took a lot of reps. And Jack's ability to improve and, and be able to execute and get reps with a blue offense, with the first team offense, um, we got to see and be able to see that happen consistently. And Jack is improving that way. And is that a detriment to a quarterback sometimes when, when another quarterback comes in for one or two plays in a game? Well, I, th I don't think any quarterback likes to rotate. I haven't met very many quarterbacks that like to rotate in and out like that. And that's what you create. You know, we're trying to establish some consistency throughout it. And it's very hard on a quarterback. I think if you would ask them, I don't think there's very many quarterbacks that like to rotate. Sure. Thanks, man. Hey, it looks like Tom Scott joined us late. So, Tom, go ahead and ask a couple of Andy. Tom, can you hear us? I'll try to come back to the time. DJ, you said you had one more, so. I've, yeah, Andy, I just wondered if you could answer the second part of my question, just about being seven games in as a head coach and just mm -hmm. 
that the learning curve for you too, in, in terms of uh, self-evaluation and dealing with game management, clock management, all kinds of stuff that you maybe hadn't had to do before this year? Yeah, there's no question. Every day is a learning experience, BJ. Uh, every day is a learning experience that we enjoy. Like that's a beautiful part about this game is being able, as much as it is for the players to go out on the field, there's, there's situations where we go on the field and it's play at periods. And we learn as well as coaches every single day on the field. Um, and the evaluation always starts with myself and the coaches and where we go from there and the consistency within that. And so there's plenty of areas that we got to continue to improve. The mentality of this team starts um, and ends with me. The, the game operations and the communication in the game starts with me. And that's why I take responsibility to your question. And those areas of learning, there are certain things that we control and those little things, we've got to make sure that we do an unbelievable job organizing and practicing and preparing the things that we can control. Communication off the sideline. Being able to make sure that in those critical situations, we have full control of what we can control. Game management situations, there is debate on what we could have done, would have done, hindsights, all that stuff. Are there things that we have learned through the course of the year? Yeah, there's things that we've learned. Um, are there things that we would do different? Yeah, are there things that have been questioned that we wouldn't do different? Most definitely. And so um, keeping perspective is everything, um, but having the willingness to learn every single day is a huge part of it. Thank you. Tom, looks like you might be there now. <laughs> Am I unmuted? Yep, you're good. Okay. Uh, Andy, uh, I noticed that uh, Davis Cutter is listed as the backup on the depth chart at the agency spots. Um, any, what, what's the status of guys like, like Latrell Cable, Shea Whiting, one of the true freshman wide receivers, or should we just not read too much into the depth chart? No, those guys, um, no, Shea Whiting and those guys, uh, they have done a tremendous job. Um, a few of those guys obviously have been banged up, um, Latrell. Um, being one of those guys. So uh, he's coming along. We're really excited about the progress of Latrell's made. But there's, there's, we have seven guys that we feel confident about easily. Um, that's one of our deepest positions on the roster. Um, and Davis can play either or uh, position. And that's what he brings to the table is having the knowledge to play inside or outside. Um, and as we move through this week too, that will be solidified uh, more so in terms of the competitions to see who uh, deserves the right to, you know, to be the next man in the game. Because we have plenty of guys that are capable. Okay, and uh, special teams were very big in this game last year on the blue turf. Yeah. And they were very big for CSU last week at Utah State, obviously. Is this a, a normal week in special teams prep or an abnormal week? I mean, special teams are always a huge priority. The games that we've done, we, we've been successful and we've been able to have game changing plays and, and um, what that looks like is a, a lot of different things, whether it's um, field position, um, creating explosive plays, um, whether that's returns or stopping returns, stopping fakes. I mean, every week it's about finding a way to change the game on special teams. Thanks, Andy. Thank you. All right, Coach. Thanks for the time. We'll uh, see you later in the week. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a good week. We'll see you guys.